Uh, my presentation won't be as visual um, compared to Michael, but um, this presentation will particularly focus on um, online and distance higher education um, based off of my book um, that was just published um, this August 2021. Um, so as so before we begin, um, I want to highlight um, these two Rut Rutledge books that just came out this summer. Um, as what as Christina mentioned, um, the one to the left, um, online teaching and learning in higher education during COVID-19 um, is the first published um, volume to focus solely on um, online and distance education during the pandemic. And um, um, the book covers several um, important key topics and themes um, as um, what Michael has already discussed it about, um, such as instructional design, um, the book highlights the importance of video conferencing, social media, online assessments, faculty inter interaction, information and communication technology tools, online learning, as well as how do we, as practitioners and educators, um, cultivate uh, a sense of belonging or a community for online learners. Um, I also wanted to highlight the book in the right, uh, which also um, dis um, discuss current um, issues with study abroad and educational mobility, especially um, with the pandemic um, creating a lot of restrictions and um, students um, experiencing difficulties traveling overseas. And um, this book um, covers um, very key timely themes and topics on um, education abroad and international students um, from a global perspective. And the both um, are available um, for purchase or you can feel free to contact me and I'm happy to give you a complimentary copy of my book. Okay, so um, based off um, uh, off my book, um, I wanted to highlight um, as what Michael and I've already talked about some of the key impacts of COVID-19 on, uh, on work and learning. And um, I use this um, framework in my book um, which is often used it um, to something we call as pest analysis where we talk about this, um, certain factors that um, are influenced by the pandemic. So uh, one, so there are four key factors that I discussed and which is particularly uh, one social, two economic, three technolog technological, and third, and fourth um, political. And all of these um, factors um, contribute um, to the challenges that we face in higher education um, as of today. Um, I think the most important thing to notice from this slide is particularly with social, um, I think the key thing that we um, are always experiencing nowadays is that the pandemic is widening uh, the digital um, divide, particularly for uh, between um, affluent um, upper class wealthy countries compared to um, low, you know, lower class, um, lower income countries where access to technology um, is creating a significant um, barrier and challenge for um, students to gain access to online learning. Um, another thing that I think it's important to um, highlight is um, the issue of mental health issues. Um, this is really important, particularly here in the United States where many students um, are having difficulties um, 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 balancing both um, online learning and in-person instruction. And part of that is because um, most students um, learn differently, um, despite the fact that many students are growing up in the digital age. Uh, many students um, do not learn the same um, way um, when, when they're learning in person compared to learning um, online. And this has resulted um, particularly with um, grades being decreased, um, GPAs um, being affected um, by many students. In, here in the United States, and I would pretty much say about the same thing um, across the world. Um, when, when we look at technological factors, um, um, I think one important thing to notice is particularly with the adoption of hybrid learning models. Uh, we, we've already um, talked about that, particularly with the high flex models um, that Michael talked about, uh, talked about earlier, as well as the increased use of learning technologies uh, particularly for faculty members um, who um, who are, may experience this challenge to use um, technology in the classroom. These two other factors I'm not going to talk about um, 
in the in this slide, but I wanted to highlight these other factors, both internal and external factors that um, has affected um, higher education in terms of uh, both economic and political. Um, here in the United States, um, um, earlier this year, um, um, one, one of our big um, association did a survey of all um, institutions of higher education to understand how, what are their plans of, um, of institution going remotely. And here we see particularly um, here in the U.S. that approximately 65 to 70 percent of institution when we combine both hybrid or high or high flex and primary or fully online, about 70 percent of institutions plan to have mostly online courses um, compared to about 30 to 35 percent are planning to have uh, mostly fully in person um, or other. And um, this is pretty much, I would say, about the same um, across the world um, in terms of roughly about 70% of the global um, worldwide. Most institutions are um, adopting a mostly fully online or hybrid model um, during the spring 2021 semester. Some key um, specific higher education challenges um, that um, occurred in, that I've highlighted in the book is these poor is these four particular categories. Um, one um, is that um, both students and faculty report the inferior, inferiority of online learning versus face-to-face -face instruction. And I think this has been a very key um, issue that many uh, students, particularly here in the United States, sort of question the value of online learning. Um, they, many of Amer many American students view it as somewhat inferior and not or not as high quality compared to face-to-face -face instruction, um, yet despite the fact that they have to pay about the same um, amount of tuition and fees um, at, that, at their institution. Another key challenge is, of course, student satisfaction and motivation are suffering. And we know um, from several surveys that have been conducted here in the US that um, students are not as satisfied um, with online courses compared to face-to-face um, -face instruction. And that has, of course, in turn affected their grades as well as their college completion, their graduation rate, um, along with the time to degree um, 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 in higher education. Um, another issue is increasing workload. Uh, faculty are forced to, you know, to learn a new technology or a new learning management system. And that has created um, some resistance among faculty members. And um, along with um, limited resources that are available um, to faculty to support um, online um, instruction. Um, other um, challenges that I just want to briefly highlight um, that I've um, sort of touched upon in the book is um, the issues of developing technical infrastructure, particularly among low resourced and non wealthy institutions. Um, many particular countries such as in Africa, like um, Sudan or Chad, uh, many of them don't have that technical um, resources to allocate for, um, to their institutions for um, new software. Um, and that has created um, some difficulties in terms of students getting access to um, online learning. Um, issues, of course, with the learning, new, learning a new management system and video, video conference, as I've already talked about as well as faculty members um, are, are very, tend to be mostly resistant to learning a new technology. And, and, and I find that uh, particularly true for faculty members who are tenured, particularly those who have 10 years or more experience um, as a faculty member. And there has been several studies um, over the past decade that has um, sort of kind of um, added evidence that many faculty members are resistant to um, learning um, a new technology. And of course, I think the biggest issue is obviously unequal opportunities to access technology, especially um, the rural, especially poor, impoverished children, um, uh, families of color, students with disabilities, as well as students of refugee status. Um, come challenges, there are many new opportunities that I really believe higher education um, has opportunities to inform students, particularly with integrating new learning skills um, and competencies uh, with 
uh, the force of students going into online learning. Uh, we know that students are likely going to be more tech savvy. Uh, they're going to be more digitally literate as well as more competent, and that will help them particularly, um, hopefully, um, translate those skills into to the workplace environment. Um, a, a new, um, I think, a good good thing about with online learning is that it reaches underserved student populations, particularly those who may not have access to any education at all, um, especially those in the countryside, in a developing country. Um, it gives opportunity to teach collectively within and between borders, as well as research collaborative, collaboratively across countries. Um, it offers opportunities to create new joint and broad degree programs, particularly for study abroad, um, for those who do want to learn uh, virtually overseas for virtual exchange programs, um, as well as um, offer new online degree programs. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware on this past June, Zayed University has uh, formed a new collaboration with Min Monero and how that might, um, uh, what that may look like, I'm sure, um, will affect um, the future of how um, higher education is going to be operating um, for that institution. So I wanted to highlight, particularly since um, the modes of learning, uh, the seven types uh, that we um, currently experience um, for most online degree programs. As what Michael have already um, um, discussed, it, um, I think the key um, difference is Everyone talks about um, the difference between asynchronous and synchronous um, learning. Um, obviously, asynchronous, asynchronous is mostly online learning at where students could access um, the online education anytime and anywhere. And that has, create, that has a lot of benefits, uh, particularly for those who want uh, flexibility or practic practicality or more affordability where students um, can set their own time to go to course to pursue their own coursework. Um, it allows students to not have any scheduling conflict, so students could um, learn at their own pace. Um, however, there's many limitations to asynchronous learning, such as um, lack of immediate feedback and comments from the instructor. Um, there's oftentimes from past research, there's low levels of participation. Some students um, experience self-isolation and, and a few may um, require, you know, self-discipline to actually get them into the course because they're not really motivated. Um, on the other hand, when we think about synchronous learning, um, students are learning real, you know, real-time online learning where students can participate from anywhere. And typically that's often face-to-face -face, um, interaction where uh, faculty members could, um, or faculty and students can receive immediate feedback and, um, and it increases a lot of accountability and, and helps students um, stay on time and in structure. Um, one of the thing that one of the um, types of learning um, that has significantly arise as a as a result of the pandemic is uh, bichronous learning. Um, it's similar to blended learning um, in that um, blending of both asynchronous and synchronous online learning, where students can partic participate in any time and anywhere learning during the asynchronous parts of the course, but then participate in real time activities for the asynchronous sessions. And I wanted to just show you this um, diagram where, um, where it's pretty much a combination where students could um, blend and learn at their own pace, as well as receive immediate feedback and interaction from the faculty members. Um, typically, um, there's more use of audio visual um, communication um, and much research has shown um, from my understanding that blended learning can have a positive impact on student outcomes um, particularly with um, increasing student satisfaction improving um, student learning as well as success along with increasing um, retention retention and access um, for um, students the other four types of learning um, that are out there today um, is, of course, hybrid and high flex. Uh, I won't talk about that really much since Michael has already um, talked about that. Uh, blended synchronous is, is a combination of face-to-face -face and synchronously online students in, in the course. So students um, have, a, some, have 
um, attend so students can choose between face to face and online. And one thing um, that has recently came out is flipped learning, where faculty um, assign students uh, lecture materials and presentations to be viewed at online, and students come back face to face to discuss uh, materials learning. Um, I, I find the flipped learning is actually a new phenomenon that a lot of higher education has started to really recognize uh, because students um, typically can't can um, inquire about lecture content, um, test their skills in applying knowledge, as well as interact um, in hands-on um, activities. So, so, I, I, so part of um, this presentation, I just wanted to share my five personal recommendations, uh, particularly with the use of blended learning and how we um, as practitioners, educators, and scholars can create an inclusive um, learning community. community. Um, one um, recommendation that, um, that I'd like to offer today is, to, is for us to think about, you know, really being easily accessible to um, your students. I think um, sometimes when we do online learning, uh, we think everything should be automatic and we don't have to be as engaged, but that's actually, the complete opposite. Um, when when you're teaching online courses, you have to show um, support to the students um, through email, through virtual office hours, virtual breakout rooms, whiteboards, lecture recordings, study sessions, and all of these makes a huge difference in um, building a, an authentic relationship with the students, especially for those students who feel, who needs that extra emotional support um, and individual attention. Um, it's, um, I always encourage all faculty members to think of, you know, just being available and just seeing opportunities to um, provide any support that you can um, virtually, because from my experience, I think they greatly benefit from these one-on-one -on -one interaction. Um, my second recommendation is to send weekly announcement or a weekly task checklist to your students. Um, I do this typically for all the courses that I teach is to send a weekly announcement um, to remind students of their goals, their assignments, their tasks for the week, as well as to provide encouragement to my students and to present them with um, a few tips that they may face in working through weekly assignments and materials. And I think that really makes a huge difference is when a faculty member sends a and a weekly announcement or a personalized message to the student to remind them about completing X, Y, and Z, it really, it really does give um, some encouragement that this, this faculty member does care for uh, my success in this coursework. Uh, my third recommendation is to create a survey to understand student interests and needs when teaching online. And I, I think this is very important is when you're running in any online course, it, um, it's important to understand the needs, the, the learning preferences, um, the individual beliefs of how they actually learn um, in an online setting. And everyone learns differently, particularly um, um, when we're doing it remotely. So these are some of the few questions that I typically ask when I, um, uh, when I want to, when I start my online course, I, run a survey just to get a feel to see where the students are at. Is there anything that I could do differently to making sure um, that I could help them um, in the class in the classroom? So, you know, I think one of the things that I, I think the first question is probably the most important is, does the student have reliable internet access and equipment to um, um, read the materials, to post um, comments um, on the discussion boards? Because quite surprisingly, a lot of students, particularly in developing countries, uh, may not have access to the internet or yet alone have some sort of safe study space that they could actually study um, out without any distraction um, online um, in, in their household. So I think it's important to kind of, um, you, know, ask, you know, ask these sort of questions um, and ask about accessibility questions, you know, and it, do they prefer, you know, synchronous or asynchronous um, recordings, um, as well as the time, you know, what times do they, do, you, do you expect to be available for engaging course content like audio or video? And these are just, and I have other questions that I'm happy to send you, but these are typically the top four questions I like to ask my students. Um, the fourth recommendation is to create guidelines for online discussion. Sometimes when we do online discussion, 
um, stu some students may not want to engage fully, um, or they may be a little shy or not sure how to respond. So every time when I create, when I start a class, I have some sort of community agreement. Uh, these are some of the agreements I like to like outline to the students to let the um, student know of some of the procedures and policies of how they should go about in, in going going through online discussions because it's important to you know listen respect, respectfully without interrupting. It's important to appreciate differences in terms of ideas, inputs, um, to allow everyone to speak, uh, to help them recognize that it's a safe space, um, you know, creating that um, sense of a welcoming community where all students could share um, without the fear of being criticized, uh, assume good intent, but acknowledge impact. And, and, you know, if someone makes a comment, you makes a comment you find offensive, let them know. You know, I think all of these agreements will inform the students the expectations and norms that are required for um, online discussion boards. And finally, I think um, the, the, the last um, recommendation I'd like to offer is to prioritize, prioritize equity and inclusion. I think this is so critical that a lot of students, uh, well, not soon, but faculty members forget is that uh, we have to support low income, rural students, refugee students, um, students with disabilities by creating a welcoming environment that represents and celebrates the diverse perspectives and includes um, explicit actions to eliminate bias. It's important for all faculty members to create some sort of safety, well-being, inclusion that is, that is just as important as academic rigor. Sometimes faculty members focus too much on content and you know, creating expectations and policies, but um, if, if faculties don't focus on creating a well-being and inclusive environment, it's hard for students to really engage in the classroom and, and helping them uh, be welcomed in, um, overall into the online course. Um, part of the principles that I like to use is something called universal design for learning principles. Um, this is commonly used for any online um, curriculum that is created by any faculty members. Um, and, and this framework pretty much um, explains that there should always be more than one way to represent information, engage with information, and express comprehension of information. Um, everyone learns differently. And um, I think it's important to focus, you know, on the layout, on the consistency, uh, making uh, it easy to read and understand. Because sometimes, as faculty members, we sometimes use a lot of jargon and, you know, confusing words that may not um, connect well with um, some students who may not be as high achieving um, when they learn um, from online. So. Um, so one thing I think I like to encourage this faculty is to consider universal design for learning principles um, and kind of embedding it into the framework. And all of this I have to say, um, if I have, if you don't remember anything from my slide or presentation, is the importance, is the key component to online education is faculty training. We have to train faculty and prepare um, faculty to teach online courses effectively. Um, because if we don't prepare faculty members to teach online courses effectively, we will likely see a higher amount of students dropping out from the course, students will become less engaged, and there has been a lot of recent research now over the past two months um, since, um, the, um, since the opening of the fall 2021 semester that students' grades are dropping significantly. Um, as a result of going into online education, um, because a lot of that is just faculty work prepared to um, engage students to fully, you know, help them with um, online materials and, and communicating um, to the students of how to engage in the classroom. So faculty training training is critical, and I encourage everyone to um, you know seek support from their own institution to, to find ways to um, increase the training that is provided um, for online education. So it's 3 o'clock a.m. and um, that, that's my contact information. Um, feel free to email me and I'm happy to send you um, the slides or PowerPoint um, at the conclusion of this session. Thank you.